of this work. Uh, this is a joint work with Shrikant Srinivasan and Sebastian Tavanas. I see Sebastian is in the audience. Um, so hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, let me get started with the talk. The talk slides are slightly longer. So uh, maybe at one hour, I, I'll just uh, kind of stop wherever I am. And then uh, if somebody is interested in the details, I can uh, go through that a little bit extra. But we could also stop at one hour. So um, just let me know if I'm kind of uh, not keeping the time or something like this. And uh, questions, uh, uh, how do you usually handle them? Is it, uh, will somebody just unmute and ask? That would be great. So usually, yeah, so they'll unmute and ask, but if you prefer, yeah. we can take questions at the end. No, it's fine. Uh, it's good to have questions uh, coming along if there are any, yeah. Sure. Okay, thanks. So let's get started. Uh, uh, in this talk, we are primarily going to talk about polynomials. And um, a way of computing polynomials is through an algebraic circuit. An algebraic circuit is uh, simply a DAG. Um, it takes at the leaves, uh, some variables or field constants. And using a DAG-like structure, uh, which uh, can combine these uh, leaves uh, using either plus or multiply operators, eventually computes a polynomial at its root. Uh, there are different parameters about this circuit that we'll be interested in. One such parameter is its depth. The depth of the circuit is simply the length of the path from uh, uh, the longest path from the leaf to the root gate. For example, in this case, the depth is three. Uh, you can see that the circuit is actually layered with at the top gate, uh, it's a plus gate, then there is a layer of multiplications, and then there's a layer of additions. And you can always assume the circuits are layered in this fashion with alternating plus and multiply. And we also sometimes call such circuits, for example, such depth three circuits, sigma pi sigma circuits because there is a plus at the top, then a layer of multiplication, then a layer of addition. And uh, without loss of generality, one can also assume that the top layer is a plus gate, because if not, you just put a arity fan in one plus gate at the top. So we'll assume that uh, the, we have plus gates at the top. Um, the size of the circuit is another parameter we'll be interested in, and that's just the number of operators it uses. In this case, just plus and multiply operators. And uh, you'll see that there are the eight operators being used. So size of the circuit is eight. A formula is a circuit where the underlying graph looks like a tree. So um, for, for, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to concentrate on constant depth circuits which allows me to interchange interchangeably use formula and circuits. Because if you're given a circuit, which is of constant depth, and if I want to convert it into a formula, the additional blow up of converting a DAG into a tree by repeatedly copying certain gates uh, is not too much. So we will uh, sort of interchangeably uh, use circuit formulas and uh, not make a big deal out of that. So uh, the area of algebraic complexity theory uh, studies polynomials. Take, for instance, this very simple polynomial. What does it do? It takes all possible subsets of the underlying set capital N and multiplies out the variables from that set. Uh, you can see that it is a sigma pi circuit for this polynomial. In fact, any polynomial can be written as a sigma pi circuit because you can always write up any polynomial as a sum of its monomials. And in this case, this specific polynomial requires uh, two to the n operations. But uh, you can quite easily also see that this other representation for the same polynomial, which happens to be a pi sigma representation, um, only uses order n operations you can quite easily check that it is computing the same polynomial, except it's doing it slightly differently. And uh, in my notation, I would call this a sigma pi sigma circuit, where the top sigma gate is just arity uh, fan in one. And in general, GF, but they are identical in GF2, but maybe not, not as real or uh, actually. Yeah, they are just identical everywhere. 
Okay, yeah, I'm just multiplying. Monomial, the yeah, monomial by monomial, the two polynomials are just exactly equal. Got it. Yes, yes. Yeah, Indeed. yeah. And uh, then in general, you know, when you are given a polynomial, this is a very simple example. But in general, the question is how easy is it to compute a certain polynomial, or how many operations are necessary to compute any given polynomial, and. Uh, uh, Often uh, the question one asks is, how many operations are essential to compute certain polynomials? Such questions are called lower bound questions. And um, uh, why would one uh, think about lower bound questions? Uh, so one really good reason to think about lower bounds is it's a dual to algorithms. Algorithmic thinking is very useful uh, in real life. This is what humans do all the time. And uh, when for a certain problem, we are not able to find efficient solutions after much effort, uh, the natural question then to ask is, why is it the case? Is there something very inherently difficult about that problem? And uh, that's how lower bound thinking begins. And uh, it's useful to uh, understand the roadblocks in coming up with algorithm, alg efficient algorithms. Uh, yet another reason to study algebraic circuit lower bounds is a step towards p versus np question so uh, algebraic circuits are uh, syntactic objects they compute formal polynomials uh, however because they compute these formal polynomials it's also known that to prove lower bounds here will be a first step towards proving boolean circuit lower bounds and boolean circuit lower bounds uh, is a question is a PNP question slightly disguised uh, in uh, a more general language. So in order to kind of make a way towards uh, resolving the P versus NP question, which most of us think is an important question, um, algebraic circuit lower bounds is considered to be a first step. So these are a couple of reasons to kind of make a case for studying algebraic circuit lower bounds. Now, so what do you uh, yeah. Here? Like, can you just speak to that for a minute? When you say formally easier, is this? Uh, you just give me a uh, reference. Uh, yeah. So you could uh, look at maybe uh, yeah, uh, 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 any uh, survey, survey, survey uh, research, research uh, result. Uh, for different time instances, and now uh, to include the missing entries or the prediction. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Maybe you can, yeah, thanks. Sure. Thanks. Should you. I yeah. Please. Yeah. So, uh, like we were talking about Boolean circuits, actually, if we think about only constant depth circuits, a lot is known in Boolean circuits, actually. From the 80s, really strong lower bounds are known for Boolean circuits. But the picture is not as rosy in the algebraic world. In the algebraic world, uh, of course, the basic lower bounds are known for a long time for this very, very simple representation of sum of monomials or sigma pi. If any polynomial needs to be written in sigma pi format, it must use as many gates as the number of monomials in that polynomial. So if you give me a polynomial, say, for instance, the polynomial from our previous example, then it has two to the n monomials. And you can come up with polynomials, which, uh, for example, even this polynomial, which require really large size sigma pi circuits. So in sigma pi notation, uh, lower bounds are well understood. Uh, they are very easy to come up with. Just give a polynomial which has lots of monomials, and that will be a hard polynomial for sigma pi notation. But if you just look at slightly higher complexity, so Consider sigma pi sigma circuits, which was the picture we drew early on. The best known lower bound for this is just short of cubic. And this is a result by uh, Neeraj Kayal, Chandan Saha, and Sebastian Tavanas from 2016. Um, now, if we look at even slightly higher uh, complexity. So sigma pi, sigma pi. Before our result, a two to the, uh, n to the 2.5 lower bound was known, 
This is by Gupta Saha and Tamke. And if we consider larger depths, so depths larger than five or more, then super linear lower bounds were known prior to our work. Uh, these are results by Shub, Smolinski and Raz. So uh, before our result, uh, exponential lower bounds were known for just a very simple sigma pi notation, but for anything higher, no super polynomial lower bounds were known. So now with this much background, I'm already ready to state our main result. So our main result, yeah. By lower bounds, you mean explicit, uh, like explicit. not count? Explicit, yeah. So let me make this point a little clearer. Thanks for this question. So uh, what one can always do is by simple counting arguments, prove that there exist polynomials which are hard to compute in these notations. By hard, I mean you can prove exponential lower bounds for, pol for random polynomials. That is, there exists polynomials which are hard to compute in these notations. However, if you need explicit polynomial, where explicit means uh, it is easy to compute every coefficient of a monomial, then we do not have strong lower bounds. So with that, I can now tell you what our result is. We show uh, a super polynomial lower bound for constant depth algebraic circuits. So we get super polynomial lower bounds for all constant depth algebraic circuits. To be very clear, so if n, d, and delta are growing parameters and d is bounded by log n, uh, we assume throughout that the characteristic is zero for this result. Uh, then we, we show that there exists an explicit polynomial uh, let's call it P and D of degree D such that any algebraic circuit of depth delta computing it has large size. So what is this large? It's N to the D to a certain number dependent on the depth. So suppose depth was two, then it's say, you know, N to the D to the sum exponential in two and if it's three and so on and so forth. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, clearly what, uh, in some situations we get slightly better. I'll uh, tell you about that shortly, but this is the main result. And you can see this is super polynomial. Okay, so this is the main statement of the result. About the polynomial, the polynomial that I talked about on the previous slide, I just called it P and D, but it's actually a very well-known, well-understood polynomial. It's the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial. You are given D matrices, each of N square variables. So these are N cross N matrices. The variable set uh, in the, uh, addressing the entries here is disjoint from that in uh, the, so variables here are disjoint. Uh, is a fresh set of variables here, another fresh set of variables here, and so on. So you have n square d many different variables. Uh, each entry is a fresh variable. And when you multiply these matrices out, you get a resultant matrix. And IMM is simply any one entry of this matrix. Let's say 1, comma 1 at the entry. So that's it. That is the polynomial. So once again, um, we have, in terms of IMM, I can state the result again. Uh, first two lines of the statement are exactly the same as before, except now I'm giving you the bound in terms of IMM. The last line is a special qualification I would like to make. We get tight lower bounds if the depth of the uh, circuit or formula we are considering is three. So for higher depths, we don't get really tight bounds, but at depth three, we indeed get a lower bound, which is quite strong, exponential lower bound, not just super polynomial, but exponential lower bound, which is n to the omega of square root t. And uh, by uh, simple divide conquer like approach, it is not very difficult to see um, that IMM has depth four circuits of this size, 
and in fact by previous results we know that imm also has depth three circuits of this size so in that sense at depth three the result is tight so, so in full generality this is the result yeah please go ahead obviously uh, you said to n to the power 2.5 or something was the lower bound for depth three right what was the lower bound no uh for depth 3 it was n cube by log square n so that was independent of d whatever degrees that was the best known or like what was the dependency of, on d on that uh, results yeah so d and n were related there but in terms of both the parameters it is still n cube by log square n okay so yeah no explicit dependence uh, other than maybe uh, D is like n or something. Yeah. Thanks. So in IMM, D is both the degree and the number of matrices, right? Yeah, correct, correct. So IMM is defined in a way that the number of matrices forms uh, what the degree of the polynomial is going to be, because you take in every monomial there is exactly one entry from each from matrix. Each. Right. Exactly. So this uh, d being smaller of log n is not a. I mean, you don't, don't even have to show it to me explicitly. It's just if you look at IMs with those many yeah. matrices and good. To exactly. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Right. So this is the statement of the result. I hope the statement is clear. And the uh -huh. low bound is tight yeah. for IM, but uh, yeah. Okay. Just okay. Yeah, I will come back to this, circle back to this point one more time later. But uh, let me be uh, so at depth three. I want to say that it is not some inverse exponential in O of delta, which you know I will um, not specify very clearly. It is a specific function. So, for example, if I could do n to the d to the one by delta here for our right. original result itself, then Uh, you can see that, uh, or one by delta, or one by delta, delta minus one, or something. Then you will get n to the d to the half, right? So if if my lower bound in general was n to the d to the one by delta minus one, say, right? Then if I substitute delta equal to three, then I'll get n to the d to the half. Uh huh. So this sort of a lower bound seems like the one we want to prove in general because. This is the largest possible one can get for uh, IMM. Okay. Right. Uh, but um, we are not getting that in general. In general, the dependence on delta is uh, growing, is decaying inverse exponentially. So it's d n to the d to the one by two to the delta, or something like this. Instead okay. of you know one by delta, it's two to the delta. So everywhere for larger delta, we are not getting. Uh, Nice uh, exponents in delta, but at depth two to the three, we do get it. And uh -huh. the tightness that you know, why is the why am I calling this tight? Because also, IMM can be computed by depth three circuits of size n to the order square root t. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So I let let I'll bring that up again in the next slide as well. Sure. Okay, so let me uh, do that. So. uh does this take us closer to uh, vp versus vnp so vp and vnp are uh, the algebraic uh, equivalents of p and np vp sits inside vnp i'll not define them but uh, just think of them as something you will map in the algebraic world from p np and uh, from a older result of uh, gupta kamat kayal and uh, saptarshi we know that if Uh, a polynomial is computable in VP, this smaller class. Then, in fact, it can also be computed by sigma pi sigma circuits or formulas of size n to the order square root t. This is true for any polynomial computable in VP. Now, suppose somebody tomorrow comes and shows that there is a polynomial in VNP such that any sigma pi sigma formula for it needs n to the little omega square root t. Then we would have shown VP is not equal to VNP. 
because you know you have found something that requires strictly larger uh, size but anything inside vp is computable in this strictly smaller size so this would be a route towards vp versus vmp our result doesn't quite do that what we are able to do is that i don't know whether it's visible is it i hope it's visible so we are able to say there is a polynomial in vp imm is actually computable in vp so we are not with a candidate polynomial in vp we are not going to be able to separate vp from vmp with our result anyway but also we are able to give lower bounds which are omega of square root t so what we would have liked to have is a polynomial in vmp for which we have n to the little omega square root t to actually get vp versus vmp but even so uh, this is still uh, some progress because such strong lower bounds for general sigma phi sigma formulas were not known for any polynomial prior to our right so uh, that's the setting so i just uh, kind of told you the main result there are a couple of other results we get in the paper um so because we have a lower bound uh, we immediately have also a polynomial identity testing result let me tell you what that means um so given that a certain polynomial is hard to compute for a certain class of circuits in this case say sigma pi sigma circuits if sigma pi sigma circuits cannot compute something that means they are intuitively a weak class that's what we are able to show through the result if a class is weak then certain other problems that people find interesting about these classes become easy to solve for those classes uh so uh specifically we show that polynomial identity testing problem becomes easy for this class of uh, circuits so what we show is that if you are given black box access to constant depth polynomial size circuits computing some polynomial over characteristic 0 then there is a deterministic algorithm that can check in just sub exponential amount of time whether the polynomial is identically zero or not so by black box what i mean is you are given the circuit but not explicitly it's not completely written down what you can do is you can check what does the circuit evaluate to at a specific point these are the kind of queries you can ask the circuit give a point uh, of uh, in n dimension and ask what does the circuit evaluate to at that point by asking only sub exponential many such queries you can determine whether the polynomial is identically zero or not so you know uh, trying to understand what the circuit is capable what the circuit is computing is an interesting question about circuits themselves in particular is it an identically zero is it a circuit computing an identically zero polynomial is a question people uh, find uh, is a uh, question of uh, importance this is called the polynomial identity question and what we are able to show is that because this class of circuits has a lower bound that means they are kind of weak this problem becomes easy for it to be solved so how easy it's sub exponential time solvable so prior to our work um there was a result that showed that sigma pi sigma circuits where the top fanel is bounded by k uh, for such circuits polynomial identity testing question can be solved in time n to the order k and this was a result by uh, saxena and shashadri from 2012 this is the best known result today for sigma pi sigma circuits so you can see if the fanel of the top gate even becomes something like n then this result gives an n to the n running time which is not sub exponential and in this result we are allowing the fanel to be anything sigma pi sigma where top fanel is anything uh, but we get sub exponential time running time uh, sub, sub sub exponential time pit Uh, the way we obtain this result is there is a algebraic hardness versus randomness uh, setup uh, along that we combine with our lower bound and this setup that we use is from uh, chau kumar and solomon's paper 
uh, they do this for a small degree uh, case, but they build upon older results of Kabanets in Bakliyatsu and Dvirshvilka in Yehudaya. So I'm not going to talk too much about this result, uh, but essentially I'm trying to say that this gives a polynomial identity testing algorithm as well, our lower bound. Uh, we also get the depth hierarchy. Depth hierarchy is essentially like uh, something you may have seen as the time hierarchy or space hierarchy. You know, if you are given more of a resource, you can compute more. So in this case, we say that if you are given more depth, then you can compute more polynomials or, you know, can easily compute polynomials. So what we show is that assume fields of characteristic zero for every constant depth greater than two, and some growing parameter s, there is a polynomial q gamma of depth gamma and size s such that. So this polynomial is computable by size s gamma depth circuits. However, if you reduce the depth even by one, then they require much larger sizes than s, s to the little omega one. So this uh, up to this slide, I have told you the set of results we have. First is a lower bound result, and using the lower bound result, we get a PIT result and a depth hierarchy result. And the, the feature for this hierarchy theorem is that this polynomial again is explicit. Like oh, yeah. Otherwise, you can just do a counting argument. Uh, exactly, exactly. So throughout, I think the uh, main thing to remember is all polynomials are explicit. Um, here, the polynomial is not exactly IMM, but uh, it's close. But it's what? Uh, it's kind of close to being in IMM. Um, yeah, IMM can compute these polynomials, but uh, they are not exactly IMM. So I hope the statements of the result are clear. Please ask questions if they're not. So, Is there a candidate uh, for going back a few slides with this uh, uh, VNP versus uh, yeah question so there was a is there like like the IMM is there a candidate for this there exists the open one yeah yeah I mean uh, there are many well studied candidates like permanent polynomial is one that uh, people have studied heavily there is a Nissan Vigrasen polynomial that uh, lots of people from this audience very audience have studied uh, very carefully uh, all of these are polynomials known to be in VNP some of them are not known to be hard for VNP, but permanent is also hard for VNP. So hmm. these would be definitely the candidates uh, that one tries. But okay. we don't know at this point how to uh, use their hardness to prove anything like this, unfortunately. I mean, uh, of course, when we get this for IMM, it implies lower bounds for permanent and harder polynomials by just you know reductions, but uh, it doesn't give anything better. Correct. Yeah. And it gives not the tightest lower bounds for uh, harder polynomials. Like for permanent, you won't get the tightest lower bound because uh, uh -huh. the, the result here only works for small degree right now. So uh, when you do the reduction, it will work for up to a certain degree and then uh, it will not scale beyond that. It will just give like end to the log and lower lower bounds hmm. for a permanent, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Right, so now the rest of the talk, I'll basically talk about the lower bound because the other two results are implied by the lower bound. So we'll focus on the lower bound. And the main idea in obtaining the result is that of es escalation. So we prove lower bounds for some weaker class of circuits or formulas. And then we use uh, something I'll explain, uh, escalation, to get lower bounds for the general formulas. So what are these weaker formulas? Uh, I'll introduce just three terms on this slide. Um, one is homogeneous polynomials. A polynomial is said to be homogeneous if every monomial in it has the same degree. It's called multilinear 
if every monomial um, has at most one occurrence of any variable and if the variables are already partitioned into d sets like in imm for instance then we can talk about polynomials which are set multilinear with respect to this partition their the uh, polynomial will be called set multilinear with respect to a partition of the variables if every monomial has exactly one variable from every set so imm is a set multilinear polynomial you can see that easily where the, the partition of the variables is every matrix variables is one part correspondingly we can define models of computations that compute such polynomials for example for homogeneous uh, polynomials we have uh, formulas that compute homogeneous uh, polynomials so formulas are called homogeneous if every gate inside it computes homogeneous polynomial a polynomial a, a formula is called multilinear if in the same way every gate inside it in turn computes only multilinear polynomials and it will be called set multilinear if i think you can all guess every gate inside it computes a set multilinear polynomial in some subset of variables so we'll just talk about these three uh, restrictions homogeneous multilinear and set multilinear all right so what is the escalation result so our escalation result is inspired by an earlier uh, similar result of ras what ras proved in 2019 is uh suppose p is some set multilinear polynomial of degree d and say p is computable by formula of size s then what he showed was there is an efficient way to convert i mean there is a way to convert uh this formula into a set multilinear formula you can see general formulas there is no restriction on what the gates do whereas set multilinear formulas as we just saw every gate must compute a set multilinear polynomial there so he showed that you can convert any formula of size s into another one which is set multilinear um, of size poly s times log s to the order d okay so without too much blow just to understand um, this for a specific instance of d let's instantiate for d equal to log n by log log n what happens then if we just instantiate believe me what happens to the previous function is that specifically it says that if you start with polynomial sized formulas computing a degree log n by log log n polynomial then in fact as long as i mean a set multilinear polynomial with that degree then there is a set multilinear formula computing the same polynomial that has only polynomial size okay so for small degree polynomials for small degree set multilinear polynomials if they have small uh, if they have polynomial size general formulas they also have polynomial size set multilinear formulas that's what ras showed but any such efficient conversion in its contrapositive gives an escalation so what it now means in contrapositive is that if you can prove that for a polynomial p of that degree there is no set multilinear formula of small size that any formula for it requires size n to the some omega some function of d or something growing in d then it cannot have general formula of small size either that is it must have super polynomial size general formulas as well so you know efficient conversion implies escalation Uh, now we could have used ras's result directly if we could prove strong lower bound for set multilinear formulas but caveat here is that ras's transformation does not preserve the depth so when the efficient conversion takes place from formulas to set multilinear formulas it increases the depth we want a depth preserving efficient conversion which can then be in contrapositive used as escalation also we need strong lower bounds for set multilinear formulas so neither was known uh, prior to the work uh, what was known in terms of lower bounds and there were really quite a few lower bounds known for set multilinear formulas before our work this is a very well studied uh, model 
uh, all the lower ponds that were known prior to this were of the following sort. They were omega of some function of d, this could be an exponential function in d, times poly n. But even for Raz's escalation to work, we need the size to be n to the omega of f of d, some function that is growing uh, in uh, uh, f, uh, growing in the exponent of n in d. So, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, inspired by the uh, fixed parameter tractability literature, we call the second kind of lower bounds as non-FPT lower bounds, and the first kind of lower bounds here as FPT lower bounds, for obvious reasons. So, for the escalation to work, we need two things. One is efficient conversion, that is depth preserving, and secondly, non-FPT lower bounds. Okay, So, these are the two components that we uh, kind of manage. So one thing we show is a non-FPT lower bound for set multilinear formulas. We show that as long as d is small, for any constant depth delta, set multilinear formula of that depth computing IMM must have size n to the d to the exponential, uh, inverse exponential in delta. Then we combine it with, um, so this is the non-FPT lower bound we show. And then we show uh, two efficient conversion results, which in contrapositive give us the required escalation. Um, let me tell you a little bit about efficient conversion as well. What we are able to show is that if you are given a general formula computing a polynomial of degree d, of size s and depth gamma, then you can convert it into another formula, which is now homogeneous and has depth two gamma minus one and size poly in s and some exponential factors in d, specifically two to the O of square root d. Okay. Just like Raz's efficient conversion that took from general formulas all the way to set multilinear, we kind of uh, managed to do it in two steps. First, we convert general formulas to homogeneous formulas without incurring too much size blow up and too much depth blow up. And then we further uh, get a set multilinear formula from the homogeneous one, again, without too much size blow up and depth blow up. The size now becomes poly s times d to the order d and depth 2 gamma minus 1. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat here that this conversion, the first conversion, requires characteristic 0. And that is why in our main result also, we keep saying characteristic 0. If somehow we are able to improve this and remove the dependence on the characteristic, then in fact, the main statement will also start working over all characteristics. This is the only place where we use characteristic zero. Now, if we have uh, efficient conversion results, these two, let's just use them in the contrapositive and get the escalation, which is quite straightforward. It says that if there is no, uh, if any set multilinear formula computing P needs size n to the some factor growing in D and depth to gamma minus one, then uh, this I'll start calling super polynomial size set multilinear formulas from now on. So if P requires set multilinear formulas of super polynomial size and depth to gamma minus one, then it requires homogeneous formulas of super polynomial size and depth to gamma minus one. And then by the second contrapositive, it requires general formulas of super polynomial size and depth gamma. Okay. So, just to put both these things together, the degrees kind of stay the same in, let's say, the left uh, bottom yeah. left parts, like as you go down the degree. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the D is, is the same it as is if you start the same That's important. So this formula. Oh, monomial by monomial. Yeah, exactly. Not really. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. 
So you just take some representation of that polynomial, same polynomial, say it's by general formulas. Now I convert it into a different representation, which now starts becoming a homogeneous representation. It's a homogeneous formula, uh -huh. but it's still computing the same polynomial. So degree is a parameter related to the polynomial that stays unchanged. Correct. The only thing that can possibly change are size and depth, which are parameters related to the model of computation. And uh, they don't increase uh -huh. too much. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see the main. So uh, what we just saw is that we have this. Um, the right kind of lower bound we need for escalation to work. So you can see that if I can prove that IMM is IMM requires large size circuits in the set multilinear uh, case, then by using these two results, uh, I'll get super polynomial lower bounds for general formulas for IMM. So that's really what we do. These are, this slide is like a one slide summary of our main, uh, the outline of our proof. So get a strong lower bound for set multilinear formulas and escalate to get general formula lower bounds. Yeah. Is this, uh, is this okay? Yes. So um, now I think uh, I have like around 15 minutes or so or 15, 20 minutes maybe I started. Uh, so in the rest of the time, I'll just try to give you the highlights of what we do uh, to get this lower bound. Set multilinear lower bound. A couple of um, uh, salient features, uh, which I already highlighted a little bit uh, but let me just say it, say it one more time. At depth five, uh, we get set multilinear formula lower bounds for IMM of the sort n to the omega square root t. And then using escalation, you can see depth five after escalation becomes depth three for uh, general formulas. And we get this tight lower bound I was talking about earlier. So, over here, if you plug in n to the square root d and then escalate, then depth 5 will become depth 3 with the same lower bound. So we get n to the square root d lower bounds at for general formulas at depth 3 by this procedure. The tightness, as I already said, is thanks to the older depth reduction result of uh, Gupta, Kamath, Kayal, and Saptarsh. Okay. So in the rest of the time, I will uh, tell you a little bit about how to prove this strong lower bound, super polynomial lower bound for set multilinear formulas of large, uh, of constant depth. So as any lower bound in algebraic complexity, the main basic outline for proving lower bound here is exactly the same. So how is it, how is any how how are typical lower bounds proved in algebraic complexity? What one does is one comes up with a measure mu. A measure mu is just a map from polynomials to real numbers, and one shows that the polynomial you want to show is hard to be computed, has very large measure, but the class of uh, circuits or formulas or the model of computation that you want to show cannot compute that polynomial. For that, the measure is small. So any polynomial computed, what we want to show is that mu for IMM is large and mu for set multilinear sigma pi, sigma pi, sigma circuits is small. And then by then saying that, you know, if for all sigma pi, sigma pi set multilinear formulas, if the measure is small, then how can it compute IMM? So that's how one obtains any lower bound. And let me demonstrate a lower bound like this, which was known for sigma pi sigma circuits with respect to IMM. Set multilinear sigma pi sigma circuits with respect to IMM. 
So these were this was a result from the 90s by Nissan and Victorson. And let me tell you a little bit about their lower bound. So suppose um, we consider this partition of variables and we uh, we consider this set D and we partition into two sets P and N. Here, uh, I'll, I'll just for the uh, sake of convenience call P as positive and N as negative. It has no real bearing on anything being positive or negative, just for uh, you know, simplicity of uh, usage. Um, so let MP and MN be all possible multi set multilinear monomials uh, that come from positive variables and negative variables respectively. So for example, if P uh, takes on first and second uh, sets, X1, X2, and the rest of the sets land up in N, then capital X1 and capital X2 land up here and the rest of the sets land up in N, then monomials that come from multiplying any uh, one variable from first set and one variable from the second set, all such monomials land up here. And similarly for the rest. For a polynomial F, we define a matrix, or rather Nissan Victorson define a matrix MF. This matrix is, the rows of this matrix are indexed by monomials coming from positive sets, and the columns are labeled by monomials coming from the negative sets. And an M1, M2 entry of this matrix is the coefficient of M1, M2 in the polynomial F. It's a very simple uh, matrix. This matrix is uh, known as the partial derivative matrix. And the measure that I told you about on the previous slide that Nissan and Victorson defined is the rank of this matrix. So you can see that it is a measure in that, in that every polynomial can be uh, associated with a real number using this measure. And uh, in this case, it's very simple. It's just the rank of the matrix, which we denote by RK of F. So let's try to work out what um, it is for IMM. Okay. So let's look at IMM polynomial, which I'll write slightly differently here. Okay. IMM polynomial can be written as some of its monomials. And any monomial that appears in the IMM polynomial looks like this. It takes some variable from the first matrix. Uh, but finally, because IMM is going to be 1, 1 at entry, it takes 1, comma I1 for some I1 uh, index. But then the next variable that will appear in the monomial will be that the column corresponding to I1 will now be the row corresponding to the second matrix that I'll pick. So the next variable will have index I1 and some new index I2, following, followed by I2, I3, etc., up to ID minus 1, 1. So any monomial in IMM has this structure. Now suppose I put all the odd um, indices in P and all the even indices in N. Then Let's look at what appears here for any arbitrary uh, row comma column. So if I put all the odd entries in uh, P and all even entries in N, then the rows will be indexed by certain monomials that look like this, right? One, three, and up to D minus one. Let's assume D is even for simplicity. And columns will be indexed by variables from 2, 4, etc. up to D. And when will this be a non-zero entry? Exactly when I1 equals J1, I2 equals J2, ID minus 1 equals JD minus 1. Right? Only those monomials appear in IMM. For all other monomials, the coefficient is essentially 0. So if we view this matrix in this way, with monomial ordering in this fashion, then in fact, it's not very hard to see that IMM gives rise to just an identity matrix. And of course, identity matrix has full rank. So 
so imm in fact has full rank recall we wanted to come up with a measure we wanted to show that the measure is large for imm and small for the model of computation we want to prove lower bounds for we have already shown what the measure is which is rank of the partial derivative matrix and we have just shown that imm has large measure so now suppose i want to prove lower bounds against depth 3 set multilinear formulas i actually want to prove it with respect to depth 5 but let's just do this as an example let's try to prove a lower bound with respect to depth 3 set multilinear formulas here any depth 3 circuit looks like this it is a sum of product of some linear forms and because this is set multilinear the linear form only depends on one variable set so now if lij is a linear form depending on just one set of variables any linear form is just a rank 1 uh, quantity uh, rank 1 matrix so rank of any lij any linear form is just one it can't span anything more than one dimension and uh, by uh, product uh, um sub product uh, how shall i call it sub productivity right of ranks um um product of lijs the rank of that is also at most one and then by sub additivity of ranks you can say that rank of the entire circuit itself any sigma by sigma circuit is at most whatever is the size of this sum and which is s in this case so we have shown that sigma by sigma set multilinear formulas have measure at most s and imm has measure quite large n to the d so if sigma by sigma circuits are to compute imm s must be at least n to the d minus 1 and therefore we get a lower bound which is very strong n to the d minus 1 lower bound on set multilinear formulas of depth 3 This is Nissan and Wigdersen. Nissan and Wigdersen proved this. Last three slides are essentially a summary of what Nissan and Wigdersen did in 1995. So this was known prior to this. Now, how does one generalize this lower bound for depth five set multilinear formulas? This was not known. So let's try to generalize the same lower bound for depth four sigma pi sigma pi. Can But, I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, please. So, uh, what, what, what was the relevance of uh, script P and script N? Like this, uh, so far everything would have worked for just the even odd. Yeah, so, yeah. In this case, yeah, you are right. For IMM, um, P and N, we could use odd and even and uh, get high rank. Um, it is not under our control. Uh, i mean um so um so odd and even is okay as a, uh, witnessing hardness you are right mm -hmm. so to witness hardness we just took uh, you know for the hard polynomial put uh, all odds in uh, uh, p and all evens in n and uh, mm -hmm. that was the way to show imm is hard to be uh, has very large measure but okay Uh, we may not be able to uh, always achieve that. Um, in the next example that I'll show, also we'll use a similar partitioning, but mm. there have been other ways of partitioning uh, variables which have helped in achieving hardness. Right. Um, in other lower bounds. Right, and the measures are a bit more general than just rank. Like rank was just a like, like a specific. Right. uh you are right in that the measure should also be a uh, kind of uh, you what you perhaps uh, uh, if i am not mistaken if i understand you correctly you are saying that it also depends on how you partition the variables in the right. sense suppose suppose i uh, put all the first n by 2 in positive and the last uh, first d by 2 in positive and last d by 2 in negative it's not clear imm will achieve full rank anymore indeed yes 
right so yeah that's absolutely right so the measure is kind of dependent on how you partition the variables as well uh -huh. okay so uh, yeah it's probably wrong to say that the measure is just rank of some matrix one has to say which matrix right but i guess it's for analytic purposes so you can pick the one that works ah yeah so for the lower bound to work we could choose uh, sort of what p and n are and uh, right and other uh, many other things about the measure can be also very very right in fact many versions of the measure have been uh, studied and uh, different types of lower bounds have been benefited by choosing things uh, more carefully and so on right. in fact so, r proof can also be thought of as a careful way of choosing not just the p and n but also uh, what these sets x1 x2 are ah huh, okay yeah yeah thanks yeah 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 so what i want to now show on this slide is that actually if we just try to use this nissan victorson like measure it already faces problems for sigma pi sigma pi set multilinear formulas so i'll just uh, mention a polynomial this is called product of inner product polynomial for a very simple reason that it is indeed a product of inner product so what is it it takes two consecutive sets of variables every set of variables uh, can be written as we are writing it as j i1 j uh, i mean x j1 x j2 x j n so m variables per uh, set and we have d such sets and what we do is we take two consecutive sets and um, think of the variables in that set as ve vectors so they are vectors of length m and we just take inner products of two consecutive ones and then we take product of all these uh, pairs of inner products so we took inner product between first and second vector third and fourth vector and so on and then we just multiplied all of them this is a product of inner product polynomial uh, as you can see it has a pi sigma circuit so just uh, depth 2 or if you want to just call it sigma pi sigma circuit for the uh, uh, for the notation we started using then it's depth 3 but of size very very small md however if you try to partition the set as we did before that is all the odd indices going to p and all even indices going to n then it's not very difficult to see that the matrix corresponding to this polynomial is in fact a per permutation matrix because as soon as you tell me which variable you are taking from the um, specific odd set the variable in the even set is completely determined so therefore this is a polynomial of small depth this is um, i haven't introduced product depth actually i should be saying this is a polynomial which is computable by pi sigma pi circuit so if i were to use the uh, notation like we have been using that summation gate is at the top then there is a a fan in one summation gate here sigma pi sigma pi circuit this is a sigma pi sigma pi circuit of very small size but has full rank what that means is this measure achieves full rank for some polynomial computed by set multilinear sigma pi sigma pi circuit that means the step 2 in our lower bound proof which is to say that imm has large measure we have achieved but to prove that set multilinear formulas of sigma pi sigma pi achieve small measure for this particular measure we cannot achieve because there is a polynomial inside this uh, circuit uh, class which achieves full measure so therefore we cannot hope to prove um, uh, using the same ideas even a lower bound for sigma pi sigma pi set multilinear formulas but in a, a very influential work into uh, in the last decade uh, neeraj kayal and uh, uh, introduced a new measure shifted partial derivative and using that measure in a work uh, of gupta kamath kayal and uh, saptarshi they managed to prove really strong lower bounds for sigma pi sigma pi circuits 
and uh, actually for get to get this for imm there were other uh, a series of works but what was finally achieved was that uh, set multilinear sigma pi sigma pi formulas require the kind of dream size we have been trying to uh, show lower bound for uh, in using the measure introduced by uh, neeraj but it is not clear how to use this measure even to go one step further which is to uh, prove lower bounds for set multilinear sigma pi sigma pi sigma circuits so uh, now just uh, for fun uh, what we do here is we kind of combine partial derivative measure with uh, different set sizes okay so at this point let me just take stock of time ha uh -huh. so i think i've covered kind of one hour i think um, i have some proof details here uh, but perhaps it is uh, kind of late to present proof details right uh, what i would like I think to we say we can go ahead if there is a sufficient interest or else maybe we could kind of give people a chance to um, maybe uh, leave or something and then uh, we can some interested people can stay back or anyway that could naturally happen um that's fine of course um okay so maybe we can take some questions at this point if there are any uh, and after that we can go into the details of the proofs yeah or yeah. i could what i could also do is uh, present yeah please go ahead no i'm i'm just saying i vote for proof details and yeah like others can chip in okay yeah and uh, yeah sure so let me just uh, say a little bit uh, i have like five or six slides but i don't think i should go through all of them but i'll give you the basic idea um right so uh, what we do is okay yeah. yeah like coming from a different field so ignore these like dumb questions but these are called partial mm -hmm. derivatives because the monomial is like a the partial derivative with respect to the column or yeah. the row uh exactly so for example if we take partial derivative with respect to the variables that index the positive the positive variables what you are left right. with are monomials in the negative variables uh huh so this is like some form of the hessian of uh, these things um hessian would be like uh, Maybe it's yeah, it's slightly different from that. Hmm. Your partial derivative measure basically the name comes from the fact that you have um, if uh, if you took part if you took derivatives with respect to variables that are indexed by p, then what you get. Uh, you take the entire polynomial and take derivatives with respect to variables that appear in p then what you get are variables monomials uh, polynomial whose monomials are from variables in n so i think that is perhaps but maybe the like somebody in the audience may know more historical reason for why this is called uh, the partial derivative measure as far as i know this is why it is but maybe there are other reasons i'm not entirely sure Okay. If there are any other questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so let me just uh, give a little bit of proof details. Not too much. There are a lot of numbers and fractions that will appear, but maybe I'll hopefully be able to just verbalize most of the things. Um, so what we do here is actually uh, vary the set sizes, not just. p and n but also the set sizes so for us um positive variables are are uh, larger sets and few of them and negative variables are smaller sets and slightly more in number overall we want the number of monomials coming from positive variables to be equal to the number of variables coming from the negative monomials thus this we want and we would like to choose alpha and t in order to make sure that that happens and uh, for the sake of 
defining the polynomial clearly, we also use the fact that the set sizes are powers of two. And uh, let's say this is some power of two, say two to the k, then this is a smaller power of two, say two to the l, not too small either. And we make sure that t is chosen such that, you know, um, so here we get two to the k times t uh, different possibilities because you could choose any variable from each. So you have, you want to match kt to d minus t times l. So that's how we choose uh, d and l. Um, and now because the set sizes are of size uh, power of two, we can think of each uh, as, you know, a, a set which is isomorphic to zero one to the k. And now uh, every variable now can be represented by a Boolean string of zero one to the k. This sort of th thinking helps in defining the polynomial. Effectively, our polynomial is a lot like that IMM monomial uh, things you saw, but um, oh, are you able to see my slides? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, so what happens here is we choose, uh, so the hard polynomial consists of all monomials which look like this. Take sigma one from first matrix, sigma two from second matrix, sigma t from the tth matrix, followed by mu one from t plus one th matrix, etc., up to mu d minus t from the dth matrix, where the concatenated strings mu one to mu uh, sigma one to sigma t and mu one to mu d minus t have a specific property that they are just equal. So whatever is the a concatenated string obtained by considering sigma one, sigma two, etc., just equals the string obtained. Only such monomials are in the polynomial and no other. By adding such monomials and by some thinking we did on the previous slides about the measure and polynomials, you'll be able to see that this has full rank because only those monomials survive which have this equality property. And equality property also will kind of induce a permutation like matrix. So this has full rank. And it's not very difficult to see that this polynomial can be computed by the general IMM polynomial. I will not explain how, but it is easy to do. Okay, so IMM, if, if I give you a complete IMM on two to the K many inputs, uh, where every layer or every matrix has large size, two to the K cross two to the K size, then by setting some variables to zero, and retaining some other variables in that large IMM, you can actually obtain this polynomial. So it's called a projection reduction. It is done, but just believe me. So though we are trying to prove the lower bound for IMM, we'll actually prove the lower bound for this polynomial. So we have the set sizes, we have the measure, uh, we have the hard polynomial and we have the measure. And we have uh, not clearly shown how this measure is full for uh, uh, this polynomial, but you can believe me that um, because this looks a lot like a permutation matrix, the rank of this uh, corresponding matrix is full. Now the question is, can we now show that the rank of set multilinear sigma pi sigma pi formulas is small under this sort of sets uh, division? and p and n and so on. So it's the same measure, by the way, we are still looking at mf and the rank of mf, but because we have divided these variables in a specific way, uh, we will be able to show that in fact, the rank can be uh, small. We can, we can show that the rank of this is small under this way of thinking about the measure. Okay. And uh, one simple case is, when we, so we start analyzing these formulas, sigma pi, sigma pi formulas. So you have a sigma gate, a pi gate, and inside a sigma pi, sigma. We already have strong lower bounds for sigma pi, sigma pi, Nissan and Victorson. We already saw that. So we are going to kind of try to use that in one of the cases. So 
f is any such term inside this plus gate okay and this term can be maybe uh, written down as product of f1 f2 etc up to fr what we will try to show is rank of f is small because if you are able to show that rank of f is small then by subadditivity will be done and uh, how small right so as i said there will be some fractions but don't worry up so much about them for each fj it is a set multilinear formula and uh, you know it takes some number of variables from positive sets and some number of uh, some number of indices from positive indices and some number of indices from the negative fj is a sub formula inside the overall one so it may not be using you know all positive variables all negative variables it may use some subset uh, so, uh, some indices from here and some indices variables from here and now what we'll try to show is um the rank of f which is just by productivity of the ranks equal to rank of each one of fi's but rank of each fi falls short of its reasonable uh, of its dimensions by a quantity which we call the loss okay what's the numerator here the numerator is basically square root of number of rows of fi matrix corresponding to f1 and number of columns of the matrix corresponding to f1 because note every variable set is of size 2 to the k and if you choose p1 indices from positive then the number of rows of f1 matrix corresponding to f1 is 2 to the k p1 similarly the number of columns is 2 to the l q1 uh, we could have taken min of these that will the rank of uh, f1 is actually min of these but this quantity you know the square root it's like a, a geometric mean of the two product, you know so we 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 can just take that as well so sometimes it helps to think about the rank in this way so rank from linear algebra is like min of these but let's just define it for now as square root of product of these and uh, this will be the maximum rank maximum quantity that this product can achieve square root uh, product square root of product can achieve for f1 whose dimensions are uh, whose number of rows is this much and columns is this much but if it falls short then that is the loss factor i write in the denominator so what we try to do is fj's rank maximum could have been the numerator under this new notion of rank but it gets some loss if we are able to show that every fj gets lots of loss then overall we would be able to show that overall rank of f is small so that's our overall goal so we divide this proof into two cases again i won't go too much into detail of either one of them but for interested audience i'll just give some details uh, we show that we divided into two cases either a degree of specific fj is quite large and if the degree of specific fj is quite large that means i have a reasonably large size sub formula which is using up a whole lot of indices from below it because it's it's a really large degree thing so you know it's already using up almost square root d degree of the overall degree d if that's happening then i can somehow resort to this nissan vectors since uh, thought process that this fj is nothing but a sigma by sigma set multilinear formula we know those are weak and we can use the fact that if it's already taking up around square root d positions inside it and if that itself has very small rank then no matter what the rank of all the other fj fi is not equal to fj is this alone will incur a whole lot of loss that's what we say so if there is an fj that occupies a whole lot of space under this d positions that is it has a substantially large degree then in fact it ends up because of nissan vectorson type argument it ends up incurring a lot of loss okay i'm sorry that i won't be able to like give full details here but uh, this upper bound is by nissan and vectorson and this lower bound is just by simple computation and the fact that pj plus qj 
has large value so um, on the like a bird's eye view um, first case is when there is one fj which is with very large degree then that alone is enough to witness lot of loss in the rank on the other hand if all fjs have very small degree then it's not any more very easy because we cannot have inductively or uh, not inductively but we cannot appeal to sub formulas and their weakness any more so this is the case where we need a new idea from all the older ideas one could have come to a proof up to this point okay so even without changing set sizes and so on and so forth one could have proved this much from all the older ideas i would say the new idea is in trying to analyze where all fjs have small degree and in that case the choice of l is what gives us the lower bound so we choose l quite carefully l remember was the size parameter for negative uh, sets the positive sets were of size 2 to the k and negative sets were of size 2 to the l we choose l to be smaller than k and how much smaller it's k times 1 minus 1 by square root d almost some 10 times square root d this choice of l allows us to say that no matter what pj and qj are if you take k times pj and l times qj so remember k times pj was the exponent for the number of rows we have 2 to 2 to this quantity is the number of rows we have 2 to this quantity is the number of columns we have so the subtraction between the two is really a quantity that we will uh, will we'll, would like to lower bound because that will be uh, a quantity that will depend on the loss uh, that will give us the loss and what we are able to say is that the difference between these two quantities is reasonably large it has a lower bound it has a lower bound dependent on 1 by square root d k times square root d uh, k by square root d and using this so uh, the fact that we chose set sizes carefully allowed us to say uh, that the loss incurred in this case is large again uh, i can give the details to uh, those who want to listen to this but this is slightly uh, this is the only kind of technical part um, all right and using this we are able to say that because the difference between these two is lower bounded by this the loss is at least the quantity dependent on this by 2 okay so um, so overall just to take a step back if this was a uh, sort of uh, not clear we'll just recap what we were able to say is that at depth 5 we get n to the square root d lower bound for imm as long as the degree is small the fact that degree is small was used in coming up uh, in um, the way these parameters were chosen okay so currently in our current proof we are not able to get for general degrees but for small degrees we get uh, this lower bound and uh, more but in particular uh, when now for general formulas by escalation we get n to the square root d lower bound at depth 3 characteristic becomes 0 uh, depth becomes 3 so in conclusion uh we get these two results basically uh, which is what i already told you for general depth uh yeah sorry sorry so i'll like to say one thing that i just worked out the proof for depth 5 at set multilinear and depth 3 for general but a similar idea can be used to get lower bounds for larger depths as well okay. again those i will not present here and overall for larger depths we get these results at as long as degree is small set multilinear formulas of imm of that delta must have size super polynomial which is n to the d to the inverse exponential in delta and general uh, formulas 
uh, again for general formulas, if n and d are growing parameters, d is small due to low of log n, characteristic is zero, then algebraic circuits of depth gamma computing IMM must have size n to the d to the inverse exponential in gamma. So with that, I would like to just end with a few uh, open questions. If there are any questions, uh, please ask. I'm sorry if the last part was kind of um, unclear. I'd be happy to answer some questions if there are. So, uh, one question. So is there a notion of approximation studied in this context? So uh, let's mm -hmm. say size circuits which can approximate the polynomial within some factor. Oh, or yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. So this is called border complexity. And uh, what, so what happens is that um, there is a notion of approximation, which is that you use, um, so uh, you know that notion can be defined rigorously, but just very vaguely, um, you have an additional say variable epsilon. That epsilon variable can have very large degrees as well. And you can compute using these epsilons everywhere in your circuit, you can compute a polynomial, say, p plus some polynomial functions of epsilon multiplied by q. So say my overall polynomial f is a polynomial consisting of, say, epsilon, this new variable, and the original variables. And uh, say it looks like this, p plus some epsilon times q. Okay. Then what one can say is that, f is approximated by p because uh, so what we say is that let's take the right hand side which is p plus epsilon times q and let epsilon tend to zero then the polynomial if epsilon tends to zero this right hand side polynomial becomes p so p plus epsilon q uh, yes. and epsilon tends to zero you get polynomial p uh, so we say that if f can be computed by p plus epsilon q where epsilon tends to zero then mm. p approximates f yes and this notion of approximation is well studied um, one could ask whether our lower bound works in this approximation regime as well or not that's an interesting question perhaps it does but uh, i'm not an expert in that thanks yeah conclude, let me just give some open questions. Um, first obvious open question from our work is, can our lower bound be improved? As I said, the nice kind of lower bound would be n to the d to the 1 by delta. We get it for depth 3 circuits. So we get like n to the d to the 1 by 2 for depth 3 circuits. But in general, the depth dependence is worsening in our bound. For say, depth equal to product depth say um, or other depth six it is um, mm, for general circuits at depth five it is i think n to the d to the one by seven or something like this so it's worse than what we would have liked it to be and it grows inverse exponentially as we saw in the statement of the result so improving that would be an op uh, obvious open question Another thing would be to improve the escalation result, which I did not spend so much time on, but I just showed you how the efficient efficient simulation leads to ex escalation. And there, there was one place where I converted general circuits into homogeneous circuits. And that conversion used the fact that we are using characteristic zero. One obvious question there is to remove this characteristic dependence. That would be a nice, uh, uh, a, a nice improvement. Uh, we saw that lower bounds very nicely gave uh, efficient polynomial identity testing algorithm, the sub-exponential time algorithm I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, another interesting question would be to get um, reconstruction algorithms. Reconstruction is another kind of question about circuits that people ask. Polynomial identity testing was a question about circuits. Reconstruction is a, uh, also an interesting and very well studied question about circuits. And uh, uh, what it asks is, uh, given the evaluation of uh, the circuit at some points, uh, at some specific points, 
give the entire circuit computing that polynomial. So the circuit is not in your hand. All you have is evaluation of the circuit at some specific points. Use as few evaluations of the circuit as possible to construct the whole circuit. This is like learning. But in learning, you get adversarial question. Adversary, uh, you get random uh, points where you learn. Here, you can actually ask specific questions, not necessarily a random question, and uh, try to learn the entire circuit. So reconstruction is an important uh, question in algebraic complexity. And does our lower bound, so usually what happens is if for a class of circuits, you get a lower bound, then um, that, as I already said, shows weakness, a certain kind of weakness for that model of computation. And if a model of computation has been proven to be weak for some reason, then it is possible that some of the questions about that so class of circuits are easy to solve. Like PIT we already showed is easy to solve. Reconstruction is another such question and maybe that can be shown to be efficiently solvable. Um, another question is, can we get algebraic proof systems uh, from proof system lower bounds? And yet another interesting question would be to combine the, this measure um, to give uh, combine the known measures, like I told you, there is a very important measure called shifted partial derivative measure that was defined in the last decade and used to show many, many lower bounds. So is there a way to combine the ideas from uh, this work with shifted partial derivative measure and get better lower bounds in regimes where we don't know lower bounds right now? Um, yeah, so these are kind of some open questions. And uh, with that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much for this link. Well, thank you, Nutan, for a great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Hi, Nutan. Neeraj here. Hi. Uh, fantastic ah, hi, result. Thank hi. you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, one way to view your. Uh, Measure is the following. You take huh. the partial derivative matrix uh, mm -hmm. with positive and negative sets, maybe a rectangular one, but you very cleverly choose a sub matrix of that and look mm -hmm. at the rank of that. Right. Is, there, is it possible that by looking at some cleverly chosen sub matrix, one can get, let's say, set multilinear circuit lower bounds? Or is, is there any intuition mm -hmm. you have for? What kind of submatrices might be good for proving lower bounds? Uh, a priori, uh, I don't have any uh, like uh, direct answer for this. One way we managed to enhance a little bit uh, this without actually choosing submatrices, but by using some random restrictions in addition to um, this. And we're able to get like, slightly better lower bounds for large depth set multilinear formulas. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, maybe you are asking for general depth set multilinear, right? Not constant depth for good choice. Yes, of, ideally yeah. general depth, but yeah, even for constant depth, uh, it's nice. Better lower bounds, yeah. Yeah, I think if we get more, uh, so maybe what you're saying is if we get more loss per subterm, then we are able to push the lower bound quantitatively to a better quantity, or like better value, right? That's um, yeah. So I don't know a better choice of uh, sub matrices uh, right now, but um, one thing would be that uh, so uh, um. What, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'd li just like to clarify that um, overall matrix is square and submatrices are sort of losing rank because they are not quite square. So this is one choice we managed to do by changing the sizes. Um, what we know right now is if we, instead of using, say, two different types of sizes, if we use constantly many different size of sizes, so here, all positives were of same size or all negatives were of the same size. So it helps me to think about these positive, negative instead of submatrices sometimes. So, but then if we choose, say, 
five different types of positive uh, sizes and some five different size, uh, uh, sizes in the negative that all doesn't help it still keeps okay. giving similar power bombs and uh, um but for example if you choose every set of different size uh, yeah. you know within positives every set is of different size within negative also every set is of different size then i don't know whether uh, we get anything better or i don't i don't know this okay okay anyway thanks fantastic event again yeah, chandan have you. another question oh, yeah ಹಾಯ್ಲಿ there is some kind of background sound or some, or some connection with the mic can you hear me now ah yeah it is perfect hello yeah it is perfect now perfect now okay so i kind of have a high level question um so is it possible that um proving some kind of uh, uh, stronger lower bound for um, set multilinear formulas maybe of the functional kind uh, might mm-hmm. imply something boolean yeah. circuits yeah 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 i think um, so mm, functional lower bounds for set multilinear uh, if we can get for um, so i think in the boolean world for functional with even uh, if f2 uh, as an uh, ac0 parity uh, lower bounds are known but um ac0 um so uh, let me just uh, think again so one thing sure, is sure. Uh, functional lower bounds have two applications if we are able to uh, prove these lower bounds in the functional setting it has two applications one is to uh proof complexity because uh what this older result of forbes et al did was that uh, i mean by the roibp lower bounds and forbes functional result gave algebraic proof system lower bounds so they were able to make the older lower bound for roibp functional and get proof system lower bounds so this is one clear application of making our result functional another application is to boolean circuits lower bounds if we are able to i think get functional lower bounds um, mm-hmm. even uh, maybe like over small fields say uh, we yeah. will be able to prove um, newer lower bounds in the boolean setting i think but this i need to check okay okay like for um like wishfully uh, wish for yeah. thinking perhaps i mean can one hope, hope to get even tc0 maybe yeah maybe so I, this think, is it. i think so because yeah. i think majority is computable right so right right i think we'll get if we can get uh, functional lower bounds here then we might get tc0 lower bounds actually uh, but parameters we'll have to see because uh, yeah hello shandan okay. Uh, nice to see you in fact uh, if i can add something the i think and i Hi, sort of that, yeah. the Hi. problem with functional lower bound and not exactly but maybe uh, no problem but until now mostly the idea we do lower bound for set multilinear after we use escalation so if you want to get right. something functional lower bound you need to consider uh, that's a problem for set multilinear because yes yeah, if you add uh, some exponents of the same variable you don't change the uh, mm-hmm. values So in fact uh-huh. mostly it has to be during the escalation you have to do an ex- a functional ex- escalation i guess something like that yeah i thought a bit at some point but i don't know if it is possible maybe uh, mm-hmm. something oh so i see ah uh, i see okay mm. 
So the escalation step doesn't um, necessarily go through uh, exactly. functional lower bounds. Yeah, yes. because okay. uh, yeah, exactly. Because uh, but even for set multilinear, functional will help. No, proving functional lower bound just for set multilinear oh. will that be interesting? Yeah. Might be. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, itself will be interesting. Yes. But for but, uh, it's strange to say because if your formula you know it's set multilinear, mm -hmm. like, uh, functional lower bound just means that uh, uh, you say the polynomials are the same when you multilinearize it. Hmm. Right. Modulo right. multilinearization right. polynomials are equal. And you want to lower bound for all these classes of uh, things. Mm -hmm. So it's Correct. strange to take only one. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you say lower bound for set multilinear, you have only one element in each class of equivalence. And you don't have lower bound for, but well, at some point we want to get the lower bound for all the class and not only one element in this class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, uh, let me, I mean, I was just thinking, so I think, isn't our lower bound for set multilinear, can't it already be functional because it works over all fields, right? So is our set multilinear lower bound uh, functional already? Yeah, or, all fields. Um, yeah, right? um, the mm -hmm. definition of functional lower bound is a bit different, right? So it talks it about all kinds. It should preserve the value. Uh, zero one. If I give yes, you a zero right. one input, it should preserve right. the zero one. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's not That's clear even in right. the set multilinear. Okay, yeah. So let me say this one more time. So set multilinear proving it is already interesting from the algebraic proof system's point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether it has immediate applications to Boolean circuit lower bounds. Probably in some model of Boolean it does. And as Sebastian was saying, if we want to generalize it for general, I mean, want to prove it for general circuits, then apart from just proving functional lower bounds, there is a this hurdle of making all the escalation steps work in the functional way. Correct. Yeah. Right. Now, so, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chandra. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank Nutan again. And uh, yeah, thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.